Peter, in trying to probe free will and understand what it means in relationship decision-making or the nature of consciousness itself, you focus on information in a, what I think is a unique way. I, I, I want to try to understand it. Right. So let me say that I, I think that what people want when they want a free will is uh, a role for their consciousness in subsequent actions. If there were unconscious information causing our actions, well, we know that's the case. That's not satisfying to people. And so then the question is, is there any role for consciousness in subsequent actions? Uh, and I believe there is. So first we have to ask, well, what is consciousness? Um, in my book, I cover a huge amount of literature that basically reaches the conclusion that consciousness is the domain of information realized in the brain that voluntary attention can access and operate on. So you can think of consciousness or so-called qual quals or qualia to be pre-compiled uh, informational representations that attention can lock, lock onto, manipulate in working memory and so forth. Okay, so defining consciousness that, that way, then uh, you can say, well, is consciousness necessary for any kinds of mental operations? If it is, then you could say, well, the consequences of those mental operations should they lead to action, um, are necessary for those actions to happen. So then consciousness plays a necessary causal role. What might such operations be? I think there are many, almost all of them have to do with what we might call volitional attention or voluntary attention. Shifting your attention to this versus that. Um, so for example, let's say there's a flock of birds. The birds look identical. So there's nothing about the birds themselves that uh, will say that this one is more salient than that one. Now, what uh, you can do if those birds are consciously experienced is you can shift your attention to one bird and then track it as it's, they're flying around. And at the end of it, uh, you can point to it or shoot it. You can say, that's the one I was tracking. Now, experiments in my lab, other labs have uh, raised the possibility, the likelihood that in the absence of consciousness, you simply can't do that. So if you're not conscious of the birds, you can't lock your attention onto one of them and track them over time. So this would be one example of a mental operation that can only take place over conscious operands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, then, if that's true, the, your, your act of pointing to the bird that you were tracking at the end of it um, could only follow from you know, attentional volitional attentional tracking over the conscious operands. Therefore, consciousness in this case plays a necessary role in the subsequent act of pointing to the bird. I think there are other examples, but all you need is one example. So, given what you're saying, how then does that help us understand how brains make consciousness? Okay, so first we have to ask why brains make consciousness. Uh, consciousness is the uh, presentation of the world and the body to planning centers. So you have lots of pre-conscious and unconscious information processing that creates um, sort of pre-compiled informational structures that are then offered in a sort of buffet to volitional attention. Volitional attention can then come down and grab a certain set and track them and manipulate them and so forth. And uh, it seems that, you know, we're coming to a, an understanding of how it's happening to some extent in the brain. So, for example, we know that in early visual areas, talking about visual consciousness, that, you know, we have certain components like the N1 and P1 that seem to happen whether you're conscious of what you're seeing or not. That they seem to be automatic, pre-conscious uh, operations. But then, um, around 200 milliseconds or a little bit slower, we have in more, uh, more anterior areas, like so-called V4, lateral occipital complex, posterior inferotemporal, the emergence of a, a component called the N2. And the N2 does vary to the degree to which you, can, you were conscious of something. Then, immediately after that, um, there's a component called the P3. Now, this is centered in the, uh, dor uh, the dorsal and ventral lateral frontal lobes, the, um, and, and also in the same sort of posterior uh, temporal area. And it seems to be associated with uh, attention coming down and grabbing one or more elements from this buffet and transferring them to working memory. It's also associated with the hippocampus and perhaps recognition. So we're kind of beginning to work out the dynamics, the temporal dynamics of what leads to a conscious experience. Why does it happen at all? Well, it, um, the goal of perception is to say, this is the world. 
atten attentional and planning areas. Now do something about it. So the back of the brain is sort of uh, involved with perception, at least in the visual case, and the input starts back here and it moves forward. At some point, there's a sort of offering. This is the world as it is. It's highly pre-processed, highly pre-interpreted. Uh, and then attention can come down and process some subset of it, which is of relevant relevance to you for particular reasons. But this pre-conscious processing is fascinating. You know, it's what the Gestalt psychologists called grouping operations. It's what gives you essentially a world. So for example, I can go outside and open the door and bam, I see that the, there's a whole world and that the ground is wet. Right. There's no, there's no ground on the retina. There's no sky on the retina. There's just localistic patterns of activation. There's no wetness of the ground on the retina. That's an interpretation. That's a kind of what Helmholtz called an unconscious inference. That's just given to me. It's a pre-interpretation. Now, uh, the planning areas can come down and say, pay attention to the fact that the ground is wet. And then they can say, well, hmm, it, it must have rained. They can reach, they can make a, not an unconscious inference, they make a, a post-conscious inference. The ground is wet because it rained. But then you, you can say, oh, but the sky is blue. Oh, that must be wrong. That's a wrong inference. Maybe a gardener came do, down and hosed the garden down, right? And then you can do something about it. You can go tell the gardener to stop making the grounds wet. So you have this sort of division of labor. You have the perceptual areas acting rapidly to create these pre-compiled representations or informational structures that planning centers then can come down and operate on. And then you have uh, cognitive or planning operations that come out, down and do something about it. So you might say, you know, there's a dividing line between these sort of pre-conscious operations. Then you have consciousness, which is closely associated with the perception of the world and the body. And then the planning centers, including volitional attention, come down and uh, do something about it. That you might call a cognition. Couldn't you have that occurring without the uh, phenomenology, the feeling of, of, of consciousness, what it feels like to smell garlic or cheese or see red? Couldn't, couldn't you just have that whole process occurred without the subjective feeling? Well, in principle, yes, but I mean, this is uh, all that our uh, planning centers have access to. We don't, there is no, this is the only information that the system has access to. We might say it feels like this or feels like that, but it is the, it is nonetheless information. Um, and perhaps it's not necessary to talk about uh, quals as, you know, having irreducible units of feeling. There's simply a type of information. There's other types of information in the brain that are also causal in their own way. Unconscious, lots of unconscious types of uh, informational processing. But the only one that the volitional attentional operator has access to is what we call qualia or consciousness. But if we, we you know, put that word aside and think, simply think of it as a class of information, it is the domain of information that volitional attention can access and operate on. Then there's no need to you know, worry about the problem of feels. We can just focus on a type of information and its role in planning and attentional uh, manipulation.